Okay, okay, I miss you too, boy. School, who needs it? Oh yeah, those darn education requirements to get into NASA. Stay in school. In 2019, I was attending a science conference and there was this large display, as you can see behind me here. It was a timeline and I was not too thrilled, clearly. I'll zoom in here for you at what perturbed me. My finger was pointing at this 1981 that NASA launches the first space shuttle, Columbia. That is true. But the image that they chose for Columbia is not a mission of STS-1. And of course, you brilliant scientists know because the external main tank would have been white. So the other mission that launched with a white external tank or main tank, the terms used interchangeably, would be STS-2. And we have the great symbols of the U.S. Eagle, the U.S. flag, and of course the Orbiter of Columbia, and the two stars representing the two crew members of Engel and Truly. And what you want to jot down is uh, pretty significant, that it's the first time a spacecraft is reused. So from Columbia in April of 1981 to the return to space in November of 1981. We've seen with previous space programs that the crew will oftentimes do uh, fun little uh, character crew shots, and we do happen to have one for STS-2 here. A little throwback to the Wright brothers. So the second and last time that the exterior of the entire space shuttle configuration was all white. Now, to get you a sense of how frequently launches are delayed, like you've already saw with the STS-1, a couple of delays there. This flight was originally scheduled for the 9th of October, and then it got pushed to the 4th of November. And so it's not very common that the scheduled day of launch turns out to be the day that you launch. And it's all about safety, safety, safety. You don't want to launch when things aren't in pristine, prime, ready to function condition. One of the objectives of STS-2 you want to add into your notes is the introduction of the Canada Arm. The proper name of this nickname, Canada Arm, is the RMS, the Remote Manipulator System. Obviously called the Canada Arm as it was supplied to NASA from Canada. So a good time to look at the Canadian Space Agency. And the year in which they launched their first rocket was September of 1962. And the year in which the Canadian Space Agency, and remember uh, the national languages of Canada are both English, so Canadian Space Agency, and in French. So the establishment of the Canadian Space Agency was 1989. Yes, another one of those where you have uh, reunification, remerging, reorganization uh, through the decades of the what we call now the Canadian Space Agency. With the launch of their Alouette satellite, Canada became the third country to put an artificial satellite into space. Hopefully recall the first country was the Soviet Union with Sputnik, 4th of October 1957, and then the second country was the US of A with the Explorer 1 launch in January of 1958. Essentially, that's what the Canada Arm is. It allows the orbiter to take its payload and, like satellites, and put them into orbit. So uh, not a bad representation of what the Canada Arm is all about. This was a Google Doodle for the 31st anniversary of the Canada Arm's use in space. And then many of the early missions within the shuttle program were Department of Defense missions. So government, Department of Defense, military. And we've got DOD in your Alpha Mix appendix for you. This is the list of the waiver you have to sign and agree that you will not tell anyone about the Department of Defense agency missions that you embark on while you're aboard the shuttle orbiter. 
I'm just kidding. That's probably just a procedure for to turn a couple of switches or something. And here we have the moment in history where we have the first reusable spacecraft successfully being reused. So we definitely want to mark that. And the first reusable manned orbital spacecraft, United States. In 1982, we have three missions. The first one is just some things I'm going to mention, nothing for you to jot down in your notebook, but we have the astronauts of uh, Lasma and Fullerton. One of the things that was brought up through the Skylab program was the benefit of having students suggested experiments uh, in weightless environments. And so began the GAS program, the getaway special student programs of experiments. And here is the first time the space shuttle configuration rolls out as you might be familiar with it in your lifetime of learning about this historical spacecraft. I still remember looking at it thinking something is uh, not quite right here. And the launch of the first Columbia with an orange external tank. This is the only mission that landed at the White Sands Space Harbor, as it's now called, in Alamogordo, New Mexico. They didn't land at their usual Edwards Air Force Base because there had been some recent flooding. And so this is uh, the landing at White Sands. And uh, it was quite a harrowing landing, actually. And uh, the wheels didn't lock into place until five seconds, 150 feet before the touchdown. And there is that relief of a touchdown. The uh, landing at White Sands here was the only time that the orbiter needed to or did land at White Sands. And uh, even though there was an intense cleaning that was done afterwards because uh, so much gypsum here got uh, dust, got caught onto the uh, orbiter and in the interior, uh, Charlie Bolden, who uh, went on to become a NASA administrator, he said that uh, when he was flying, there was still gypsum coming out of everything. So uh, a dusty vehicle for the rest of its career. Astronaut Lausma was doing a uh, presentation in China about his successful mission, and he showed this image. Uh, to uh, gratiate himself with the audience as it's an image that was taken flying over China and the interpreter conveys this to the audience and there's this kind of chuckling and chatter that goes on and after the presentation Astronaut Lausma asked the interpreter did I mispronounce the name that badly or why that uh, response? And the interpreter said that uh, I think that was an atomic site uh, they had taken a picture of and I guess supposed to be top secret. Speaking of top secret, you'll remember that the Soviet Union had their orbiter and unmanned orbiter of the Baron, and these were some of the patches, mission patches that they made, which, um, I don't know, that seems, um, seems, seems quite similar, if you ask me. All right, the first mission in 1982 for you to jot something or a few things down for will be the mission of STS-4. And we have this launch of Columbia, November 1982. This is actually the last time that you have a two-member crew as the shuttle program is then at this time called fully operational. Your two astronauts are Henry or Hank Hartsfield and Ken Mattingly. Ken Mattingly of your on the tip of your tongue Apollo 13 fame. And what you're going to jot down here with STS-4 is that there was a getaway special that was from Utah State University. And in fact, in the retro looking back at the history of the getaway special program, Utah State University, more than any other institution of education, had more getaway specials aboard space shuttles than any other educational institute. 
So that might very well be a question we ask you on a celebration of knowledge. Which university had more getaway specials or um, student experiments in the shuttle program? And that would be the Go Aggies, Utah State University. So the launch of Columbia with some experiments from USU students. And the landing of STS-4 uh, is the very first time that the orbiter gets to land on a concrete airstrip landing strip. We now have the mission of STS-5. And the five-pointed star is to represent the STS-5. I think you can uh, catch what the significance of this mission is for you. We have one, two, three, four crew members. So the first time we have a crew of four, you have your commander of astronaut Vance Brand, and we actually have a name plate or strip of material from astronaut Vance Brand back in the Museum of Space in room 119 at Ridgeline. And the pilot was Overmeyer. And then we have these two gentlemen who are what we officially now designate as mission specialists. There's going to be a lot more scientific experimentation being done in these orbits. And so we need people to conduct those experiments, monitor those experiments. We need people to put the satellites into orbit. So your crew definitely needs to have now more than just your mission commander and just a pilot. You need more folks and they are designated as mission specialists, MS. And here is the very first shuttle mission to deploy a communication satellite. And that's what you want to jot down with STS-5, the very first shuttle mission to deploy a comm satellite, COMSAT. And the crew had a great photo opportunity declaring themselves the ACE Moving Company, fast and courteous service of satellite deployment. What's fantastic to note in our 21st century minds is that that right there, this huge thing, is the battery pack for these headphones. 1983, we have four missions. The first of which is a maiden voyage, a maiden flight for the Challenger Orbiter. All the orbiters are named after ships of discovery, so if you were asked what is the orbiter Challenger, what ship was it named after, or they would say she in Navy terms, it definitely would be the Challenger, Her Majesty's ship Challenger. Now the Challenger orbiter has a unique orbiter vehicle number, instead of being in the series of 100 like the others are, because the Challenger was the first uh, static test uh, model that was upgraded to orbiter status, because during its static phase, our structural test articles, what this stood for, uh, static meaning it didn't fly anywhere, but the structural test article number of 099 remained its designation of Orbital Vehicle 099. Should you ever navigate your way to Wikipedia and enter to search for Electron, and you scroll all the way to the bottom, scrolling, 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 scrolling. Why are we looking at Electron? Oh, this image right here. Let me just click on that for us. During a NASA wind tunnel test, a model of the space shuttle is targeted by a beam of electrons simulating the effect of ionizing gases during re-entry. I want you to focus right on the model itself. Right here you'll see the steel post that it's attached to in this kind of beige uh, vehicle right here. The reason I want you to look at that is because I own said model. 
and that is not in the museum of Ridgeline 119 Space Museum. That is at my house. That is somehow managed to become my personal property. Love the Challenger. Here's the crew of STS-6. What you want to jot down, of course, is Challenger's very first flight. So we have two reusable spacecraft. And this will be the first spacewalk of the shuttle program. A little fun crew photo session. And this is the first ever spacewalk for the shuttle program. This happens to be Story Musgrave and astronaut Peterson on the right here. And they are wearing modified EMUs. You might recall EMUs from the Apollo program, Extravehicular Mobility Unit. Neil Armstrong wrote a thank you letter to the NASA team that developed the EMU, especially the part that covered his face. Certainly we're zoomed in very much on the EMU display and control module, the DCM display and control module. This covering right here, we actually have one of those in the Space Museum in room 119 of Ridgeline High School. And the controls, uh, the readings on the controls you'll see are backwards. That's because the astronaut on their arms, down around here, they have a mirror. So they can't really, with their helmets and the big bulky nature of this, look down and see what the controls are. So they hold the mirror in front of their DCM and they're able to check their readings, make adjustments as needed. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to meet Challenger's, one of Challenger's first spacewalkers of Story Musgrave. At the Kennedy Space Center, they have these lunch with astronauts, and this was the display uh, centerpiece when I was there. It is slightly larger than a standard tourist backpack. Not sure how I know that piece of information, but uh, my favorite image of probably any astronaut, but particularly Story Musgrave, is the no-nonsense attitude, get the mission done right here. So obviously having problems getting that earpiece connected to a very large battery to stay in the ear, and hey, I'll just throw some duct tape on there. You gotta love it. And here is the first touchdown for the Challenger Orbiter. <laughs> 